Hello, everyone. Welcome to Bible study for today. It's good to have you with us. Um, in our Bible study for today, just like last week, um, we're going to be looking forward. A lot of the time in Bible study, we look backwards at the at the readings for the previous Sunday. But last week, we looked forward to Trinity Sunday by going over the Athanasian Creed. And this week, we're going to look forward to the readings we have for the second Sunday after Pentecost by focusing on one particular theme that Jesus is going to mention in our gospel reading. Uh, in our gospel reading on Sunday from Mark chapter 3, Jesus is going to talk about a, a sin that he calls unforgivable. And it, he, it is, he says, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And so knowing that this is well, if I were in your shoes anyways, a person listening, uh, coming to church and listening to sermons and and listening to the, the scripture readings and all of that, this is something I would want to have explained, but it's not necessarily what I, the pastor, um, the one who's doing the preaching, I'm not going to want to spend my whole sermon talking about the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So I thought we'd take some time to talk about it now so that we can get the full picture of it and it doesn't come as a big surprise to you. Uh, when you hear about it in church on Sunday. So let's jump right in with it here. The first thing I've got is just the very specific verse, kind of isolated here, where Jesus talks about this unforgivable sin. So like I said, we're in the Gospel of Mark, although you can also find uh, Jesus saying essentially the same thing in Matthew chapter 12 and in Luke chapter 12, but in Mark, we're here in chapter 3, all getting the basically the, the same phrase here, um, verses 28 and 29, right in the middle almost of our gospel reading this Sunday coming up. So this is what Jesus says. He says, truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man. Now, it would be lovely if we could just stop right there. That's a beautiful sentence, isn't it? Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man. The, the forgiveness accomplished by Jesus through his death on the cross is for all sins. It's, it's absolute. It's complete. All sins will be forgiven. And whatever blasphemies... We'll, we'll, and we'll talk a little bit more in just a second, specifically what a blasphemy is. Whatever blasphemies they utter, those will be forgiven too. But, Jesus says, like I said, it would be nice if it would just stop right there. Truly, truly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man. And whatever blasphemies they utter, those will be forgiven too. But, whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. So this is where we get this idea of an unforgivable sin. Jesus speaks pretty clearly here about a sin that is unforgivable. There's no forgiveness for this sin which Jesus calls blaspheming or blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Now, couple of things we got to deal with right away before we move on to anything else. The first thing, like I said, is we got to deal with this word blasphemy. Well, what is, what is it, what does blasphemy mean? Quite literally, blasphemy just means to say something unkind or unbecoming about somebody. You know, we tend to think of blasphemy specifically as speaking evil things against God, which is exactly what it's going to mean here. Um, but to tell you the truth, the word just means speaking evil things about anybody, right? So, it, but for our purposes today, for our purposes right now, what we specifically need to remember that it has to do with, with speaking. It has to do with words. So blasphemy isn't thoughts, and it's not actions. We're specifically dealing in the realm of words here, spoken words. That's what a, a blasphemy or evil words spoken about somebody. And in particular, in this case, we're going to see evil words spoken about God. And in particular, evil words sp spoken about a specific person of the Holy Trinity, God the Holy Spirit. So, but whoever blasphemes or speaks these evil words against the Holy Spirit, 
never has forgiveness. So this is the second thing we got to deal with. Define what blaspheme, what it means to blaspheme. But now we got to talk about why are we talking so specifically about the Holy Spirit here? Why is Jesus making such a big deal about saying evil things about the Holy Spirit? Now, there's a few ways, I guess, a person could try and explain or understand that. One would be to say, well, maybe the Holy Spirit is somehow greater than uh, Jesus and God the Father. Somehow greater than God the Son and God the Father. And so uh, so you know, it's particularly bad if you say blasphemy, blasphemies against the Holy Spirit. In fact, in, in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus even almost seems to be leading us in that direction. It's not the right answer, and it's not what he means. But Jesus even says, you know, it, you know, you can be forgiven for blasphemies against God the Son. Jesus says, you know, say, you know, you'll be forgiven for what you say about me. But watch what you say about the Holy Spirit. So it almost makes it sound like, oh, you know, God the Holy Spirit is is higher, more exalted than God the Son, and maybe even than God the Father. And so you got to watch what you say about Him. But that's obviously not true, right? We just had Trinity Sunday on Sunday. We confessed the Athanasian Creed, and in the Athanasian Creed, we confess that all the persons of the Holy Trinity are co-equal. There's no ranking among them. So it's not that one is higher or lower, and that rules out another possibility here too. It could be thinking like, well, God the Father and God the Son are are higher than God the Holy Spirit, and they've got kind of big brother syndrome going on here, and they're protecting little brother Holy Spirit, and Jesus is saying, don't you go saying bad things about my little brother the Holy Spirit. Well, no, that doesn't work either, okay? The three persons of the Holy Trinity are co-equal, so it's not that the Holy Spirit is higher than the Father and the Son, and it's not that the Holy Spirit is somehow lower than the Father or the Son that is making this blasphemy against the Holy Spirit particularly bad. It's not either of those. Instead, how Christians for a long time have understood, well, why is it such a big deal to blaspheme, to say evil things about the Holy Spirit? How Christians have understood that is it has to do with the office of the Holy Spirit, or we could say the work of the Holy Spirit. This is why blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is unforgivable. There is no forgiveness for that, Jesus says. It's because of the particular office and work of the Holy Spirit. Now think back, we just had Pentecost Sunday two weeks ago, week and a half ago, if you're watching this on Wednesday. And on Pentecost, we talked about, well, what is the work of the Holy Spirit? What does the Holy Spirit do? I preached a sermon on that from John chapter 16, talking about how the Holy Spirit convicts us concerning sin, concerning righteousness, and concerning judgment. There was this whole kind of courtroom scene about it as the Holy Jesus depicts the Holy Spirit as our defense attorney and he shows us our sinfulness so that we don't walk into God's courtroom and plead the plead not guilty because we obviously are guilty he convicts us concerning righteousness showing that our righteousness is in Jesus and he convicts us concerning judgment so showing us that the judgment is not on us because we are in Jesus but is instead on Satan on the devil he is judged. And when you put all that together, what the Holy Spirit is doing is creating faith. That's what all that means. Showing us our sin, showing us how Jesus is our Savior, who gives us his righteousness, and how the devil is a defeated enemy. All of that is, that, that's faith. The Holy Spirit works to create faith. And that's why, and we're going to see this play out here as we go through some more Bible verses after this. Oh, I just bumped the camera stand again. That's why this sin against the Holy Spirit, or this blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, is particularly bad. And Jesus would say there is no forgiveness for it. Because how do we receive forgiveness from God? Through faith. 
and those who blaspheme the Holy Spirit are blaspheming the means through which God works to give that faith. And so there, there's, there's, there's a disruption in the delivery system here. Right? The, uh, the person who is blaspheming the Holy Spirit has turned them off from the, turned themselves off from the source of God's forgiveness that He is pouring out to them through faith. They're rejecting the work of the one who creates faith. And they're rejecting it in a particularly intentional and severe kind of way. All right, so this, this is the, the first point to get, is why is it a big deal to blaspheme the Holy Spirit, to speak evil about the Holy Spirit? Because the Holy Spirit is the one who creates faith, and it's through faith that we receive the forgiveness of sins. Okay, Now, let's press on a little bit further here. The next important thing we got to do, and this is, this is true of any time we're trying to understand a difficult verse in the Bible. This qualifies as a difficult verse. Jesus is telling us there's a sin that can't be forgiven, and that's... Frightening, alarming, and scary, and makes us wonder what it's all about. Anytime we're dealing with a difficult verse in the Bible, it's helpful to look at the context. What's happening around this verse, and how can that help us understand the bigger picture? And that's what we got to do next. So let's look at some verses around what we just read. This verse where Jesus says there's this unforgivable sin called blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So we're still in Mark chapter 3, of course. We've added in a few verses, though. We've added in verse 22, which comes beforehand. We're going to skip over the middle verses. They're not particularly relevant for the conversation here today. Uh, And we're going to carry on with verse 28, and we're adding verse 30 in at the end. Try and get the picture here. Why is Jesus saying this about... why, Why is Jesus saying this at this point about this particular blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? So it tells us, And the scribes, they're people who wrote and taught God's law, in particular people who didn't like Jesus very much. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem, Jesus is in Galilee, probably um, at a place called Capernaum, which is kind of was his home base, right on the Sea of Galilee. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he, that's Jesus, is possessed by Beelzebul. Now, Beelzebul is just another name for Satan. And, they said, that's not all. So, just think about that for a second. Just stop and think about that. These guys, uh, the scribes who came down from Jerusalem, they say that Jesus is possessed by the devil. That's not good. And, that's not they're not done though they got a little more to say and they also say by the prince of demons which is just again another name for satan he casts out demons this is what's gotten jesus a lot of attention at this point is jesus's casting out of demons that's really caused a kind of a ruckus around israel and people are coming from everywhere to see jesus and to listen to him and he's demonstrated multiple times already his divine power by casting out demons now, the, and these scribes, these, the, these people from Jerusalem, part of the religious establishment in Jerusalem, they've come down and are trying to lay out a ruling about Jesus that, no, nope, he's, he's possessed by the devil and he uses the power of the devil to cast out these demons. Now, the, in the middle verses here, Jesus explains to them why that's crazy talk, because why would the devil cast out demons? That's like the devil fighting against himself, and that doesn't make any sense. Jesus lays that all out for them. But after that, Jesus gets on to this sin against the Holy Spirit thing. So he says, Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying, he has an unclean spirit. So when we add in verse 30 here at the end and verse 22 at the beginning, we start to get the picture here, right? Why is Jesus saying this about this blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? He's saying it because these guys came down from Jerusalem saying that he is possessed by the devil, that he has an unclean spirit. 
And to get why that's a particularly big deal, you've got to go back to, to Jesus' baptism, which you can read about in Mark chapter 1. And in Mark especially, it's highlighted that when Jesus is baptized, the Holy Spirit comes down out of heaven like a dove. And Mark, and it doesn't really come across in your English Bible, but if you were able to read the Greek version, um, you would read that it doesn't just say that the Holy Spirit came down onto Jesus, but literally says the Holy Spirit descended into Jesus. In a sense, you could say that, that Jesus is, at his baptism, he's possessed by the Holy Spirit. And that's the power by which he casts out these demons and does things like that. But look at what they're saying about this Holy Spirit who is descended into Jesus. They're saying, no, 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 it's not the Holy Spirit. It's the devil, right? It's an unclean spirit. So they're saying these things about the Holy Spirit, this spirit who has been given to Jesus in this unique kind of way. There is the Holy Spirit. Is God the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Holy Trinity himself? And these guys are calling him the devil and the prince of demons. And they're calling him an unclean spirit and all this kind of stuff. So this is... This is the context that's causing Jesus to say that. Now, there's a little more context we can get from an, another place in the Bible here. In John chapter 3, which should also be familiar because it was just our gospel reading this past Sunday on Trinity Sunday. Oh, we've got a whole bunch of things coming all together here in one Bible study. But John chapter 3, we have this conversation between this man, Nicodemus, and, and Jesus. And listen to what Nicodemus says to Jesus. Now, this is what John says. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. What does Nicodemus say that he and the other Pharisees know about Jesus. He says, we know that you are a teacher come from God. They've, Nicodemus and the other Pharisees, they've seen what Jesus is doing, what Jesus is able to do, casting out these demons, for example. And they've realized that he must be a teacher who comes from God. They're still, they're having, they don't understand what he's, why he's doing what he's doing. They don't understand why he's teaching what he's teaching. And that's why Nicodemus is coming to Jesus at nighttime to try and you know, figure this out. He wants to talk to Jesus and, and sort all this stuff out. Jesus in this conversation is frustratingly vague with Nicodemus, at least from Nicodemus's perspective anyways. But so they don't understand Jesus. They don't understand why he's doing what he's doing, why he's saying what he's saying. But they do know this. He's a teacher that comes from God. Otherwise, he couldn't do what he's doing. Now, coming back to Mark chapter 3 here, we're not dealing with Pharisees. We got scribes. So I just put it out there. I realize these are two different groups of people. I'm not saying the scribes and the Pharisees were the same thing. But the, scri the scribes weren't idiots either. They saw what Jesus was doing. And I'm sure they were just as aware as the Pharisees were that this is the kind of stuff that only God can do. Deep down in their heart of hearts, they know the power by which Jesus is casting out these demons. They just don't want to believe it. And so they waltz down from Jerusalem and call the Holy Spirit that they know is the power at work in Jesus, the devil. They know it. Deep down in their hearts, the heart of hearts, they know that that's really the power behind what Jesus is doing, but they don't want to believe it. So they come and they call the, whole, the, the spirit that is in Jesus an unclean spirit, the devil himself. And this is what makes Jesus say what he says. And warn them about the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit which never has forgiveness because it cuts you off from the one 
who creates faith. And it's through faith that you receive forgiveness. I've got another thing I want to share with you here. This is a quotation um, from a, a book. It's this book right here. Whoops, it's awfully big. There you go. Christian Dogmatics by a fellow named Franz Pieper. This is volume one. It's a three-volume set. These were uh, seminary textbooks. Really valuable books in terms of their ability to clearly and in an organized, structured kind of way explain to you all kinds of different teachings that you find, well, all of the teachings that are there in the scriptures for us to believe. Really helpful book. This is what he says about this sin against the Holy Spirit. The sin against the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, same thing. The sin against the Holy Ghost is committed when after the Holy Ghost has convinced a person in his heart of the divine truth, that the person nevertheless not only rejects the truth he is convinced of, but also blasphemes it. So this is the definition here, we could say. And this is, you know, this is not straight out of the Bible. This is this Francis Pieper summarizing what the Bible's teaching us here and giving us a definition, and I would argue this is a very good definition of this sin against the Holy Spirit. The sin against the Holy Spirit is committed at when a person has come in their hearts to know and to believe the divine truth. In particular, to know and to believe the divine truth about Jesus, about his salvation, and the power that he works in the world to save those who believe. The sin against the Holy Spirit is when after the Holy, Sp the Holy Spirit has convinced someone of that, has brought them to faith, that person nevertheless in spite of what the Holy Spirit has done, giving them this faith, not only rejects it, says, I don't believe that, but also blasphemes it. Which is exactly what was happening there, right? The Pharisees and the scribes, these guys all knew what was going on. They knew that no one could do the things that Jesus was doing unless he was someone sent from God. They all knew that the Spirit of God was at work in him. And yet they marched on down, the scribes did, from Jerusalem and said, no, it's the devil working in you. And that's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus is warning us about here. Now, there's a couple other verses to look at here that will maybe help us fill out the picture just a little bit further. This one's from from 1 John chapter 5, verse 16. This is one of the epistles from the New Testament. Here we get another verse that's telling us there's these two different kinds of sins. So John says, If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask God, and is pray, and God will give him life. To those who commit sins that do not lead to death. Now, I should say before we go on here, all sins do lead to death, right? The wages of sin is death. That's Romans chapter 6. It's the result of sin. But John is making a distinction here between, well, this one particular sin that we're talking about and all the other ones. There is sin that leads to death, he says. I do not mean that one should pray for that. So John's point here in this whole verse is to say, well, if we see our brother sinning, committing a sin, we should pray for them. And God will give them life. God will, will bring them to repentance and restore them to life through the forgiveness of sins, won for them by Jesus on the cross and the faith created in their hearts by the Holy Spirit. So if we see our brother or sister in Christ sinning, we should pray for them. That's John's message. However, he says, if they're, doing, if they're committing this sin that leads to death, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, John's saying, well, that's not what I'm talking about. He's not saying, I'm not saying, I do not say that one should pray for that. John's saying, well, at that point, it's too far gone. There's no, there's no coming back from that. They've, they've 
turned their hearts against the work of the Holy Spirit. They've, they've spoken those words against the work of the Holy Spirit. They've cut themselves off from the, the, the work of creating faith that the Holy Spirit does. John's saying that's a whole nother kettle of fish. He's saying, pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ who are sinning. But the sin against the Holy Spirit, that's a whole nother ball game. So he's helping us to see that there's these, in that sense, two different categories. There's sin, and then there's that sin, right? In a sense, all sins are the same, except Jesus is making a distinction here between regular ordinary sin, which is evil and deserving of death all on its own, and the sin against the Holy Spirit, which he calls unforgivable. But this is another verse that helps us to see that there is some kind of distinction there. And then there's this one, Hebrews chapter 6. And this one can help us, if you're worried that you've committed the sin against the Holy Spirit that can't be forgiven, this is the verse that helps you realize that you probably haven't. <laughs> Actually, you, you haven't, so don't worry. Uh, this is the verse that helps us to see that. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 to 6. For it is impossible, the writer to the Hebrew says, in the case of those who have once been enlightened, have been brought to faith, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have tasted the heavenly gift of God's forgiveness. We could especially think of Holy Communion there, right? Where we taste and see that the Lord is good. Who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away. It is impossible to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. Now here's where this connects into this blasphemy against the Holy Spirit and is actually good news, encouragement for us. The writer to the Hebrews here is writing about those who have committed this sin, who have come to know in their hearts, they've been enlightened, they've tasted the heavenly gifts, they've shared in the Holy Spirit, they've tasted the goodness of God's word and the power of the age to come, looking forward to that new heaven and that new earth. They've experienced and known and believed in all of these things. and yet have turned themselves away from it, rejected it, and done what those scribes did, and spoken against the Holy Spirit, calling all the good that God has done evil, and saying that, you know, saying that, that God's good work in the world through his Son, the death and resurrection of Jesus, is from the devil, or something like that. And it's impossible then, the writer of the Hebrew says, to restore them again to repentance. And that doesn't sound like good news. Whenever you hear it's impossible to restore them again to repentance, that doesn't sound like good news. But think about it for a second. If you're worried that you have perhaps committed the unforgivable sin, if you're worried that you have blasphemed against the Holy Spirit, if you're feeling guilty about that, then this, then, then you can know for sure that you haven't committed that sin. Why? Because if you did, it would be impossible for you to repent. You wouldn't feel sorry about it. Your, your heart would be so turned against God and the work of the Holy Spirit in you that you wouldn't care that you had maybe sinned against God and committed some kind of unforgivable sin. You wouldn't care. Because your heart would be so turned against the work of the Holy Spirit in you that the Holy Spirit wouldn't be able to convict you of sin, to show you sin, to show you that maybe perhaps you've done something wrong that needs to be forgiven. He couldn't do it because you would have cut yourself so, off, so completely off from him by committing that sin. 
So what this verse is teaching us is that anyone who feels sorry for their sins has not committed that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Anyone who is, who is sorry for their sins, this is, I guess I should have maybe explained with this word repentance, there's two parts to repentance, two, two aspects of repentance. One is contrition. There's sorrow for our sins, feeling sorry for what we've done. And the other is faith. Trust in the promises of God. So repentance has two parts. Contrition, sorrow for our sins, and faith in God's promise of forgiveness through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what the writer of the Hebrews is saying to us here. It's impossible for someone who's committed the sin against the Holy Spirit to come to repentance because it's impossible for them to feel sorry for their sins and and believe. But if you do feel sorry for your sins, and especially if you believe the promises of your Lord Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection and what it means for you, you haven't committed that sin because it would be impossible for you to feel that if you did. So there's good news there, right? If you're worried about your sins in any way, shape, or form, if you believe the good news about Jesus, you have not committed the sin against the Holy Spirit. Now, one more thing to wrap it up here. This is back to to this guy again, Christian Dogmatics, Francis Pieper, Volume 1. This is the last thing he says about this sin against the Holy Spirit business. He says, There is only one thing that will deliver us from the fear of having committed the sin against the Holy Ghost. We must turn our heart, mind, and thoughts wholly to the absolutely universal and absolutely free grace of God in Christ Jesus, which is revealed in the scriptures. I'm wondering if any of you have ever thought about this sin against the Holy Spirit before. I wonder for some of you if this is, you know, I'm introducing an entirely new thing to you, uh, that there's this thing called the sin against the Holy Spirit. Uh, And if I am, I'm not doing that to... um, create a problem for you or anything like that to make you to give you more to worry about in life or anything like that at all but it's good for us to be aware and Jesus says this so that we will be aware that there is such a thing as a sin that is outside of forgiveness that is unforgivable this blasphemy against the Holy Spirit it's good for us to know that and be aware and what this little quote here gives us is the encouragement. Well, what do we do about that? Well, we don't sit around wondering whether or not we've committed the sin against the Holy Spirit. That's not it. We haven't, right? If we're worried about it, like I just said, if we're worried we've committed that sin, we haven't. What should we do? Let's turn ourselves to God's word, which is where the Holy Spirit works, by the way, right? The Holy Spirit creates faith in our hearts through the word of God. Let's turn ourselves to the word of God and hear again and again and again, about that absolutely universal, which means for everyone. Universal, for everyone, and free. The price has already been paid by Jesus in his death on the cross. So it's free for you and me, grace of God. And by grace, we mean God's riches at Christ's expense. G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. God's love for you because of Jesus. Forgiveness. Life. Salvation. The absolutely universal and absolutely free grace of God in Christ, which is revealed in the scriptures. So rather than sit around and worry about the unforgivable sin, let's just rejoice in the good news of God who loves us, sent his son to die and rise again to save us, and sends the Holy Spirit so that in him we might believe and have eternal life. All right, that's our Bible study for this week. I hope this has gotten you ready for that gospel reading on Sunday so this won't be like some strange thing you're hearing when it comes up in church alarm bells won't go off when you listen to it you'll be able to hear and understand exactly what jesus is talking about and i pray 
that through all of this, you would rejoice in that absolutely free, absolutely universal and absolutely free grace of God, which is for you. Forgiveness of sins for you, for all of your sins. Now, if you have any questions, I feel like there might be questions about this one. You can put them in the comments underneath the YouTube video. You can email them to me. You can phone me and ask me. You can stop by in my office and talk to me about them sometime. Any of those ways. Great ways to ask questions and talk more. I'm always happy to answer whatever questions you send me. Take care and God bless.